Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into our talk, The Arms Race of Evasion. Today we'll be covering uh, creative evasion techniques that we have seen in the wild. I'm Partha and joining me today is Mahmood. We are both directors at Strauss Friedberg Aeon. We've been in incident response for the past eight years. And in that time, we've helped our clients respond to incidents such as ransomwares and nation state attacks. So in this talk, uh, we're gonna be covering five evasion techniques that we think folks may find interesting. These techniques range from evasion using malware to network level evasions. Whether you're a blue teamer or a red teamer, this talk we hope uh, will leave you with techniques to think about. So let's start off with a quick intro into defense evasion. Now, attackers don't like getting detected by security teams. Uh, they often employ techniques that help them achieve their objectives without getting detected. These techniques can include uh, quietly uninstalling security tools or employing obfuscation and malware. But not all defense evasion techniques are sophisticated. Some are quite simple to implement. An example of this is a PowerShell command that's on the screen. This is to disable Windows Defender. It's again, very simple to execute, but very effective in getting your malware to run. While there are several simple evasion techniques, in this talk, uh, we want to focus on ones that are creative and sophisticated. So as we progress through this talk, um, we'll be covering our case studies from a very technical standpoint. If you have any questions, please uh, reach out to us on Slack or uh, feel free to refer to these slides on the SANS website after the talk ends. So let's start off with our first case study. All right. So we'll start off with a case study where we saw multiple evasion techniques deployed by an attacker on a VPN device. So in 2021, uh, we had multiple clients that were impacted by a zero day vulnerability um, in, in Pulse Secure VPN devices. This vulnerability enabled the threat actor to gain direct access uh, to the VPN device. And using, uh, using this access, they were able to harvest credentials, bypass MFA, deploy malware, um, maintain persistence. And again, because it's a VPN device, they also had the ability to laterally move to the internal network. So simply put, this vulnerability sort of uh, enable an open door policy into a victim's internal network. We observed a lot of evasive tactics by this threat actor, but in this talk, we will cover two main techniques. One, uh, patching off a legitimate Linux binary, and the second one, tampering with onboard hash manifests. <clears throat> so let's start off with the first one. Um, now, a device or software upgrades occur on appliances like firewalls and VPNs. It's quite common. When these appliances go through the upgrade process, certain files in the data partition may be deleted or refreshed with a newer version. Now, the goal of this threat actor was to evade detection and maintain their access to the compromised VPN device even after a device upgrade. So to do that, the attackers had to first understand the upgrade process. That is what commands get executed on the device during an upgrade process. Once they have that understanding, they can now identify a legitimate binary uh, that will be executed as part of that upgrade process. Next, they just need to make changes to this legitimate binary that allows them to drop malware payloads. And finally, and this is very important, uh, because they're patching an existing benign binary, they also need to ensure that any normal calls to this binary will get processed as is and without interruption. It seems quite simple, but it requires a lot of planning. So which binary did the attackers choose here? So they chose a binary called umount. Uh, it's a binary that is commonly found on Linux systems to unmount partitions. Umount was targeted by the threat actor uh, because this binary was used as part of the upgrade process. In terms of the modifications that we spoke about, they basically prepended a script, a shell script to the binary. So the red line is where the binary is and the black line is where the shell script is. To recognize where the script starts and ends, they cleverly marked it with a start and an end tag. They also commented out the original binary. So let's try to understand how this actually worked. 
Um, so consider two situations, uh, one where you have a compromised VPN device and another where you don't have a compromised VPN device. On the non-compromised VPN device, any cost to UMount will go directly to the legitimate UMount. So it's a normal operation of UMount. But on a compromised device, uh, you have uh, 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 basically any cost that will go through this patched UMount, which will first check if the device is being upgraded. If it's not, then it's just going to execute UMount normally. But if it is, then it is going to drop the malware payload. And finally, and this is the evasion part of it, even after dropping payloads, it will still execute any arguments past the UMount. Th that way, they're not getting detected. So how does this look like in the shell script? It's basically a simple if-else statement that handles both flows, both the device upgrade flow that we just spoke about and the legitimate call flow. So let's try to dig a little bit deeper here. Okay, so I mentioned a while back that the attacker had commented out the UMON binary. Now, this would basically make it unusable, right? So how are, how are they able to handle any normal calls to UMON? So as part of the shell script, there's a function called normal underscore UM that was included to handle any normal calls to UMON without getting detected. The function was designed to first create a duplicate of the patched UMount. And thanks to the start and the end tags, the threat actor was able to remove all references to the shell script in the duplicate file. Next, after setting the right permissions, they pass all the intercepted arguments to the duplicated UMount. And once the execution finishes, the, du the duplicated file is removed. So that is how legitimate calls were handled by this malware. But what if the malware detects that it's the device is being up upgraded? So that is where uh, you have that is where you have four shell functions that were contained in the binary that were designed to uh, alter additional legitimate files to drop malware payloads, modify timestamps of those um, uh, you know uh, modified files, and also to tamper with onboard hash manifests. In this talk, we're going to be covering just one of these functions, the patch manifest function. But before we cover that, we need to make sure we understand what a manifest is. So on network devices, uh, you, know, you can find a hash manifest that tracks the integrity of files on the device. A hash manifest is simply a file that looks like this, uh, which contains a, a file path and a corresponding hash value. Now this file is used by the device to see if there are any signs of file corruption or tampering on the device. Now, throughout this case study, we've been talking about how the threat actor is going around changing legitimate files to achieve their objectives. So by making these changes, they're also changing the hash values of these files. If the hash values change, then the onboard integrity checker will issue an alert. So to handle that, the attackers basically created this bash function called patch manifest to solve that problem. So how does it work? It's a very simple batch script. Um, so first they reference the file that has been changed. They calculate the new hash value, reconstruct, reconstruct the, st the string, and then just um, you know, put that back to the onboard hash manifest, the new hash value. It's a very clever technique. So we've covered a lot in this case study. Uh, but almost every action taken by the threat actor here was to avoid potential detection. Everything from using a zero day vulnerability to patching of legitimate files, all to achieve their objectives. So for the next case study, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mahmoud. Mahmoud? Thanks, Parth. Um, Switching gears here a little bit, uh, the next two evasion techniques that we'll cover uh, will mostly focus on evasion using malware specifically. Uh, I'll first discuss the uh, bring your own vulnerable driver technique or BYOVD for short. Uh, so for background, uh, the background for this case uh, is not super unique. The technique, however, at least at the time was pretty unique. And that's what we wanna highlight here. Uh, we were responding to a uh, Cuba ransomware incident in late 2021. Uh, we came across a few malicious scripts on disk, along with a legitimate Avast anti-rootkit driver that was signed by the vendor. Uh, so 
why were the attackers bringing a legitimate anti-rootkit driver along with their scripts and how were they using it? Upon review, we determined that the driver itself had a vulnerability and was being exploited within the scripts that the attackers dropped on disk. Uh, and that was used to terminate security tools such as antivirus and EDR before ransomware was deployed across the network. Before we dive in, uh, I just wanna give a heads up that we are going to go into some technical weeds uh, on the malware analysis. For those interested, we do have a detailed blog post uh, covering this topic on our website. I will drop a link uh, in the Slack channel right after this. Uh, I would like to give a, a big shout out to Eduardo and Rob who did the research and published the blog post on this. So let's get into how the kernel driver was abused. Here's how the attack path looked like at a high level. Once the attackers got access to a victim machine, they dropped three files on disk, a batch script, a PowerShell script, and the kernel driver in question. In, sorry, uh, in the first stage of the attack, the batch script is used to create and launch a Windows service that uses the vulnerable kernel driver. In the second step, the PowerShell script is used to load a small executable in memory. The purpose of this executable is to interact with the new Windows service in order to control the vulnerable driver, and we'll see how in a second. Finally, the kernel driver was used to terminate AV and EDR processes on the system. So let's dive into these steps one by one. First, the staging. This one's pretty straightforward. In our case, the attackers dropped these three files under C Windows temp. I want to call your attention here to the Avast driver, aswarpot.sys, which as you can see has zero detections on virus total and has a valid signature from Avast software. A blue team defender looking at this might think this is legitimate or at most irrelevant to the investigation. So for the next step, or actually the first step of this attack chain, uh, the batch script does two things. First, it creates and launches a new service using the aswarpod.sys. And then after a three second timeout, it launches a PowerShell script, sample.ps1, that the attackers dropped on disk. In step two, this PowerShell script, sample.ps1, runs. It decodes the content of a hard-coded executable, which we've redacted at the bottom of this page. Upon review of that executable, we found that it basically acts like the user mode controller for the kernel driver. And it does that by sending commands to the registered Windows service that we saw in step one. Finally, in the third step, this whole setup, the controller, the Windows service are all used to terminate AV and EDR processes. Here on the screen, we highlighted the code snippet from the user mode controller. Uh, the first thing it does is get a listing of running processes on the system. And for every process name, it computes the CRC64 checksum. Once the CRC64 checksum is computed, it is then compared against a hard-coded list uh, stored within the executable. So we looked at that list naturally, and we were able to reverse uh, this list of CRC64 checksums and identified over 100 uh, AV and EDR process names, um, including most of the big names that you're all familiar with, like Avast, Sentinel-1, McAfee, to name a few. If the computed checksum matches against one of the stored checksums on the list, the controller sends a signal to the Avast driver to kill that process. And this is done using a call to device IO control using, using the IOCTL code shown on the, at the bottom of the screen here. And finally, to close the loop on this whole attack chain, here we're showing the kernel mode code, right, within the Avast driver. I don't expect you to read this code, but it's here for your reference, right? So what's happening here is if the IOCTL code that was sent by the controller, which we saw on the previous slide, matches against uh, what we have on this slide, uh, a function is called. That function is highlighted on the right-hand side, Basically, what this function does is it takes a process handle and sends it the termination signal. 
this really here is the main highlight of the whole technique, right? Because the Avast driver had the capability to take a process handle and send it the termination signal from kernel mode, allowed the threat actors to basically abuse that functionality for their own gains. In this case, killing AV and EDR processes. So this was a lot to throw at you in five minutes. I apologize for that. And like I said, I'll, I'll drop the link in Slack. But the, the, the key takeaway here is really highlighting the arms race between attackers and defenders, right? This was not the first time we see attackers bring a kernel driver, but this was the first time that we see them use a legitimate signed driver that is distributed by an AV vendor. This shows that attackers are taking samples from AV vendors and others, studying these samples for vulnerabilities, for opportunities to leverage on their next assignment. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over back to Partha for the next evasion technique. Awesome. Thanks, Mahmoud. Um, all right. So we have another fun malware evasion technique here. So let's get into it. A few years back, we were responding to an APT attack on a logistics company. And we found malware running on multiple servers, including three database servers. Now, uh, our team was trying to determine how the attackers gained access to these systems and also how the malware was transferred to these database servers. Now, during the course of the investigation, we saw that the owner of the malware file was MS SQL Server. This raised eyebrows. Did the attacker use, use SQL somehow to transfer the malware? So the team decided to review all available SQL logs on the database servers. We checked authentication logs, we checked SQL database logs, but nothing concrete. Um, so safe to say, uh, we were stuck. Uh, and it was looking like the attacker's attempt to evade defenses was working. But the team did not want to give up on their theory that SQL was somehow involved in some shape or form. Um, but before we go further and discuss how we solve this case, we need to cover two things. One, a quick primer on SQL database logs, and two, system databases and in SQL installations. So let's start with the first one. If you're investigating a compromise with your SQL server, there's no shortage of artifacts available for your review. We're not gonna be covering all the different artifacts that's on the screen here. Instead, we will focus on two main artifacts, the MDF and the LDF. MDFs are the primary data file for a database and the corresponding LDF stores the transaction logs for the database. Every single SQL database will have these two files. So if you accidentally delete a table, let's say, or, um, or, or a, a database row, and you want to roll back that operation, this is where you can find that data. Uh, these artifacts contain deleted logs and binary objects that can be recovered using tools like Apex SQL. Okay, now let's get to the second part of it, um, understanding that there are system databases as well. So in addition to user created databases, there exists a variety of system databases with every SQL installed. System databases like the master database or the temp database, temp DB database, they all hold system level information that is required for proper functioning of a SQL server. Okay, now let's get back to the case study. So the team had reviewed the SQL logs, including the MDF and the LDF, but we hadn't yet carved for any deleted data. So we started that process. So Using Apex SQL, we initiated the recovery of any and all deleted data from every user database, and this is important, every system database as well. We were quite shocked to see what we found after we carved. So um, what was the result? Again, nothing interesting in the user database, but in the system database, we found some interesting items. While reviewing the master database specifically, we observed multiple insert operations. Additionally, we also found create table and drop table operations for a table named ABCD. So a few things to note here. You shouldn't really find user created tables in a system database like master. 
the naming of the table is also quite suspicious. A, B, C, D, um, it's quite suspicious. Upon review, the multiple insert operations that I just mentioned were basically writing hexadecimal characters into multiple rows into the A, B, C, D table. So finding all of this, um, you know, we definitely find, uh, felt vindicated and our theory was right. Um, so the hex bytes from the database, uh, from the database table, matched up exactly to the payload on disk. So there was still the outstanding question that, you know, how did the thread actor stitch all these rows in the database table to drop the payload on disk? So that is where SQL scripts come into play. We're not gonna go through the entire script here, but this is the snippet of code that the attacker used to drop malware on disk. In this case, it was saved, the payload was saved as loadperf.dll. So this entire technique of malware transfer through database tables, it's a very interesting technique when you think about it, but the attackers were not really done with their evasion techniques. They still had one more up their sleeve. Now, remember, they got the payload on disk, but they have to execute that payload. So instead of creating a new Windows service to set up the malware persistence, they decided to hijack a legitimate Windows service called WMI APSRV. This service relies on the execution of a Windows binary called WMI APSRV.exe. One of the dependencies for this binary is loadperf.dll. So I think you can guess what happens next. Uh, so they basically DLL side loaded the malicious loadperf.dll into WMI APSRV. So at this point, I'd like to reiterate, uh, we've discussed three case studies so far. And in all three case studies, attackers in some shape or form have attempted to avoid detection by maliciously using legitimate files or services. Okay, so for the last two case studies, we will focus on network level evasion uh, techniques where attackers try to blend in to avoid detection. Okay, so let's try to cover what a C2 server is first. So a C2 server is basically an attacker's base of operations. Uh, uh, the C2s are used to send and receive data from victim systems. Typically attackers use anonymized network infra infrastructure to host these C2s. So how are they deployed? Typically through malware backdoors, either through a vulnerability, uh, you know, um, or a human vulnerability or a software vulnerability. Now these malware files are embedded with C2 servers that can send and receive data. For the defenders out there, uh, it's pretty easy to detect uh, in terms of like beaconing uh, detection in firewall logs or IP address analysis or TLS fingerprinting. So if you're an attacker, uh, sorry, my controls froze for a second there. All right, let me see. Mahmoud, are you able to control? Oops. All right. It will come. You wanna go back? Okay. There's there's a there's a lag in the in the screen there. That's fine. Okay. So yeah, uh, let's get back to this. So if you are an attacker, um, uh, if you want to avoid detection, it's best to blend into normal network traffic. All right, so let's get to the background of this case. Now we had a case where we had uh, an attacker that was using very creative tactics uh, as part of their attack. Um, to conduct their malicious activities, they utilized the client's AWS instance. So our team got a snapshot of this instance to perform host-based forensics. And through that review, we discovered that they downloaded this executable from a file transfer site called transfer.sh. Now, uh, once we have the malware, we wanted to review the malware and also we wanted to see what happened around the time of execution. So what we noticed was multiple calls to Reddit servers. That's very interesting. And also uh, the client's web proxy recorded a private subreddit that was accessed multiple times over the course of 24 hours. So what was the link between this malware and Reddit? Enter Reddit C2. So Reddit C2 is basically a publicly available uh, software on GitHub. Setting this up is very easy and involves just five steps. You set up your Reddit account, and then you set up your client app in secret. 
And then you set up your team server. This is your command and control server. At this stage, you'll be asked for details like the API key um, um, and the username, things like that. After that, you compile your implant and that can be placed on the target system. And finally, after your setup is done, you basically uh, are able to communicate to this target using the Reddit API and issue any commands and also transfer files. So how does all of this work? So Reddit C2 uses comments on Reddit to send and receive data. These comments are encrypted with XR and encoded with Base64. That's kind of how that looks like. So the team server or the command and control first issues uh, a command. These commands are obfuscated and posted on Reddit as a comment, but they're prepended with the keyword in. The target system uh, or the client is constantly checking for the Reddit comment with the keyword in. If it detects it, it will execute the command and post the output again as a comment, but this time it posts as a reply with the keyword out. The team server then reads this comment and presents the output to the attacker. Now it is important to note that all Reddit comments that are sent and received happen on the private subreddit and that is not going to be public. Additionally, there's also an option for a stealth mode where all comments after an interaction are deleted. Now let's take a step back. This is not the only time social media has been used for communicating covertly. In 2017, the, it was discovered that Britney Spears' Instagram post was uh, used by malicious attackers. I don't want to dig too much into this, but there was a malicious Firefox extension uh, that utilized Bitly for C2 communications, but the full C2 URL was not in the malware. To construct the full C2 URL, the malware was designed to go to the uh, Instagram post and hash all the comments. If the hash matched a specific value, then regular expressions were used to get the remaining part of the URL. So that's, uh, that's this case study. So for the next case study, I'll turn it over to Mahmood uh, that involves another network evasion technique. All right, uh, moving on to the next and last defense evasion technique on our list for today. Uh, this one, uh, as Parta mentioned, is also a network evasion technique. Specifically, this one involves the usage of DNS by malware authors to bypass and evade detections. Um, so for background on this case, uh, this was a Black Basta ransomware investigation from Q2 2023. Um, just like um, almost every ransomware investigation, several malware samples were identified across the network. For the sake of this presentation, though, we are focusing on a Cobalt Strike stager, which uses DNS to download malware payloads. All right, controls are wonky again. Okay, um, first, a quick word about DNS. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about it at rate of versus, versus recursive. Um, but I do want to talk about one of the lesser known features of DNS, and that is TXT records or text records. So as the name suggests, these are text records associated with a domain or a subdomain. They can be whatever the domain owner wants them to be. That's the main point here, right? The domain owner can associate any random text with their domain or subdomains and allow users or processes to retrieve this random information using DNS queries. So think about the implications for a second. Uh, next is Cobalt Strike. Uh, again, I'm not going to sit here and uh, introduce Cobalt Strike to a group of DFIR professionals, uh, but I want to introduce a few terms so that we're all on the same page. First is the team server. In Cobalt Strike lingo, this is an installation of uh, the Cobalt Strike server. Uh, basically, this is your C2. Stager, uh, this is a very small uh, program whose only purpose is to get the victim machine to download and execute the full Cobalt Strike beacon payload. So what is beacon? Beacon is the actual Cobalt Strike payload that runs on a victim machine and allows the threat actors to control that machine. This is likely the thing that you've seen the most if you do instant response investigations. Finally, uh, listeners. Listeners are what the beacon uses to connect to the C2, 
and they can run over a multitude of protocols, including HTTP and DNS. So let's put these two things together, Cobalt Strike and DNS tax records. Cobalt Strike operators can register their own domain, and this allows them to create as many subdomains as they wish and have a text record with arbitrary text for each one of these subdomains. This basically allows threat actors to transfer full malware payloads, including the beacon, and any subsequent communication over DNS. So let's take a look at how this works in practice. Uh, let's take a look at the stager that we introduced in uh, the background slide here. Uh, in our case, we identified a file that was masquerading as an Excel document under C users public. We quickly determined this was not an Excel document. It was in fact a DLL, which exports several functions, all of them heavily obfuscated. Uh, however, only one of these functions were executed across the environment, and that was the Xiaopin uh, export. As you can see, the run DLL32 command was used to execute that DLL export. So upon review, we determined that this is a COBOL strike stager which used the DNS to transfer the full malware payload. This specific sample of stager was a little bit more involved, but stagers can be really like just a few kilobytes or even less, again, just to download uh, the full malware beacon. So how did the process workflow look like? First, uh, the Xiaopin DLL export is executed using run DLL32 which executes this stager malware. Next, the stager malware issues thousands of DNS requests to subdomains controlled by the attacker. So when registering myevilserver.com and all its subdomains, the attackers are able to add any random data to the text record of every subdomain. So each one of these DNS responses will basically contain a chunk of the payload and it's 255 bytes to be exact. Next, the stager takes all of those chunks and stitches them together to reconstruct the full payload on the fly. It then decrypts that payload and injects it into a new process memory. In our case, the payload that was downloaded was a Cobalt Strike beacon, which used both DNS and HTTP for subsequent communication. From there, basically the system was under the control of the attackers. And this is all done automatically. Cobalt Strike provides that capability. It's not like the attackers are registering all of those subdomains manually and adding the random pieces and chunks of the payload. Let's take a look at how um, at the network level activity, basically. Uh, this is a screenshot from Wireshark during malware analysis. Uh, we've redacted the actual domain name because it was uh, distributing malware. Uh, but as you can see here, there's uh, multiple DNS queries of type TXT issued to subdomains, AAA, BAA, CAA, et cetera. Um, the, the stager malware knows how many requests it needs to issue to retrieve the full malware payload. Let's zoom in on one of the DNS responses. Uh, here you can see there's uh, 255 bytes of data. Uh, it appears to be gibberish. This, in fact, is a chunk of the encrypted payload. Once the stager receives all those chunks, again, it stitches them all together, decrypts them, and there you have it, your beacon payload. The main takeaway here is that attackers will sometimes take the harder or slower path to achieve their objectives. Going through DNS is obviously slower and more complicated and is prone to more failures than HTTP but they will do that if it means they avoid network detection, right? This is especially true in, in more mature networks, right? Large networks that have a decent security team. If the attackers see any evidence of that during their reconnaissance, they, they will adapt. So um, that was really our talk. These are the evasion techniques we wanted to discuss. Uh, let's go through some concluding remarks. Uh, we went through some of the sophisticated evasion techniques that we've seen in the wild, but where do we go from here, right? The point of this talk was to show you that the tactics and techniques that threat actors use are constantly evolving. 
while you might not see the same technique that we that we presented today, you might see a variation of it, right? So the key here is to stay vigilant and adapt our mindset to look look for these signals and trust our instincts. If you see something that looks off, pull on that thread. Uh, this can also be done by you know keeping up to date on available content and constantly going through kind of holistic trainings in in cybersecurity. You know, like you can go shoulder surf the red team colleague that you have sitting in your lab and see how attackers do it on the other side. Um, or, you know, go through a tabletop exercise with um, other practices in your organization. We also need to make sure that we're collaborating, we're fostering an environment of information sharing. You know, uh, Brian Olson said it perfectly in the last presentation, always be learning and share widely. Um, and to that effect, we are trying to do our share of information sharing. The best way to find it is to follow us on our new Twitter handle at StrasDFIR. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, uh, a few of our colleagues here and the entirety of the Stras DFIR team who made this all possible. And thank you all for tuning into our talk, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>